uh, recent uh, 2008 uh, book on uh, phenological research, and who wrote uh, extensively on the issues of the experience uh, in the one uh, the leading uh, expert on these uh, issues, and uh, from the University of uh, Liverpool, and he will talk today about the passage in experience and reality. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here, and uh, all the organisers and the sponsors. Um, I guess I'm about. I guess, I guess we must be about two thirds of the way through this work, the workshop now, roughly. Um, which is probably a good point. Good point to pause and take stock. I'm saying that because my my um, presentation, my piece, um, overlaps quite a bit with things you've um, already seen, um, as you'll see. Um, but I also sort of try and present a framework for locating some of the disputes that are important in this area. So, in a way, this this piece, rather than breaking much new ground, it's more of a sort of pause, take stock, how, how should we think about the debate um, from this point on. Um, and the people in the remaining part of the workshop can solve all the problems. So the burden is upon you. Um, I'm, I, I work mostly in the analytic tradition in the I spend a lot of time thinking about the methodology. Um, and the thing, <coughs> 15 years or so, um, in the philosophy of time area and the um, philosophy of mind area, there have been a couple of significant developments in that both phenomenal consciousness and dynamic conceptions of time have both been taken more seriously than they were pre prior to that period. Now, the dy dynamic conception of time, you're all familiar with them, I won't go into them here, the block view presented the moving spotlight, growing block model. Um, Maybe a few others I don't know about. People have been very inventive. A lot of these are the effects of this um, moving to consider metaphysically interesting pictures like this, rather than analytic philosophers at least talking all about tense, tenseless language and facts. It's been that there's been a very welcome explosion of um, metaphysical innovation, really, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, why this is a dynamic turn, as you might call it? Um, well, the usual reasons we're all familiar with, that the Bopp universe, B theory, seems to eliminate temporal passage. It doesn't do it justice. And so some people say, I've heard it said, that Bopp theory isn't really a theory of time at all. It's a theory of space. What do you mean the block is a space-like entity or a time-like? Now, of course, in my side, phenomenal consciousness, um, Philosophers of mind have always been interested in consciousness, obviously. What's, new, what's been new over the last 15 years or so is an interest in non-reductive approaches to consciousness. Now, people in the phenomenological tradition obviously never went in for those. The whole of the 20th century, philosophers of mind and the analytic tradition did. Um, and so, non-reductive accounts of things like this, the, the old emergentist idea that um, Consciousness emerges as some kind of fundamentally new phenomenon when you organise matter in a brain-like way. Property dualism, or substance dualism, the old idea has come back. One of the most influential of the recent philosophers of mind is David Chalmers, who defends all the property dualism. Or my favourite is Russellian materialism, we sometimes call it, or I believe that it phenomenalised materialism. This is the idea that matter itself, or certain parts of matter, when suitably, suitably configured, actually possesses experiential qualities as intrinsic properties. So matter itself is phenomenal. Of course, these, physical, these phenomenal properties aren't recognized by current physics, so current physics is incomplete. This was a line pushed by Russell. You can find it in Locke, John Locke, um, Eddington, recently defended in various forms by people like Galen Strauss and um, several others. Daniel Stolge, Noir. Here's Galen Strauss himself summarizing uh, does that a hundred years of disaster, as he calls it, in the philosophy of mind, um, in a recent paper that's not been published yet. He said, first of all, the astonishing view, as he calls it, that there's actually no such thing as conscious experience at all. The astonishing fact is that this astonishing view was for a considerable time the dominant view among philosophers of mind, which, when you think about it, is absolutely crazy. What are philosophers of mind doing if they deny them with basic facts about the mind and with the consciousness? And the truly astonishing fact, in fact, it isn't actually more astonishing than the last one, is that this is part of a movement, um, reductionist philosophy of mind, 
We don't want to produce openness to today which reduced the experiential to the non-experiential, i.e. to show that the experiential was, in some way, really wholly non-experiential. So by reducing experience to, say, functional or causal properties, which aren't experiential in nature, you've actually done away with the experiential. The experiential doesn't exist. Now, I mean, that was the main movement in analytic philosophy of mind for most of the 20th century. It's now gone. I mean, it's still there. Half the people practicing still believe this, but the healthy half don't. Uh, that's, I'm working with this assumption that we're, we're just going to reject this silly, heavily reductive approach to the mind, consciousness. So what I've been looking at are some dynamic conceptions of time and temporal aspects of experience and some connections between them. And two main theses develop. First of all, obvious that a more adequate phenomenology, I took difficult here, I'm addressing mainly analytic philosophy, um, will lead to an improved version of a venerable doctrine, namely the mind dependence of becoming um, defended by Russell, Gruber, and many others. Um, and the second thesis is that temporal aspects of experience, when, when you give full recognition to those, and a non-reductive view of experience, um, they combine those, everyone can accept the reality of some form of passage. Um, so it's like a main thing. Okay, a useful starting point, um, as you know, is Arrow. Um, that's what the internet says, that's Zeno, who might disagree. Um, <laughs> recall the paradox. Um, an arrow travels from A to B, it's in continuous motion from A to B. Um, it's never at rest. It travels to an infinite number of spatial locations, let's suppose. Let's suppose that we're dealing with a continuum of classical and modern physics. Um, but at any given instant, the arrow is at rest. The instant has no breadth or duration. And the movement is traveling through a distance um, over time. So the period during which the arrow is in motion is composed of instant. Nothing moves at an instant, but if it's not in motion at any of these instants, it's never in motion at all. It hasn't moved at all, which is completely crazy, because there's the arrow moving. The paradox, <coughs> there's a standard resolution to the paradox, is known in some circles as the at, at theory, um, mainly I think from this quote from Russell, um, in his younger days there, probably about 1917, hopefully, smoking his pipe. Um, Russell says, motion consists merely in the fact that bodies are sometimes in one place and sometimes in another, and that they are at intermediate places at intermediate times. It's the at, at. It's an unfortunate name. Um, so really, this is saying motion is just occupying different positions at different times. So here, um, here at T1 and T2, this ball is at different locations, therefore it's in motion over that interval between those two times. Here it's the same location of T1 and T2, so it's stationary. So an object is moving if at neighboring times it's at different locations. Now, this is the standard view of motion in physics, I think. Um, it has a consequence, namely that motion isn't among the intrinsic properties of things. It's a relational property. You're moving if you're at different times, at neighboring times, in different spatial locations. Now, this is good from the point of view of physics, because motion is relative. I mean, there's no different proof of modern physics. But it seems wrong intuitively. I mean, intuitively, it seems a big difference between something that's flashing through the air and something that's resolutely motionless. The physicists would say, well, actually, no, they're exactly the same. There's no intrinsic difference in the way the object is in themselves between the, arrow, the moving arrow and the rock. But that doesn't drop. A bit of common sense. Um, now we, can, we can see things in motion. Objects in motion look different from their static counterparts. Um, the translation difficulty from the Macintosh version of PowerPoint to this one. Um, here's a still image which is suggestive of motion. Clearly, it's a car tumbling over. But it doesn't look like it's moving. Obviously. Um, simple phenomenology. A sequence of static snapshots looks very different than something which moves. Um, really seeing a dog move. And as we've been hearing from various papers, lots of people seem to accept this that motion is a sui generis intrinsic feature of visual experiences. You might talk in terms of dynamic versus non-dynamic visual contents. There's a dynamic one. And this is linked to cinema, movies. Um, that a bunch of static frames that are shown at 15 to 20 frames per second um, 
you see, it's, you see mo movement, but it's a bit jerky. If you speed it up a bit, 30 to 60 frames per second, and you get nice, really smooth motion. Um, on, on the cinema screen or TV screen, you've been shown static images, but you can't see them, you see motion. In fact, I think in visual experience, um, oh, another difference in, between the versions, that used to be one, two, three, now it's one, one, one. But, um, <laughs> I think there were three cases, really, um, maybe more, but three obvious ones. Something which is moving too fast to be seen at all, like a, an arrow that's really moving quickly, or a bullet. Um, you can't see them. Then objects which disappear into a blur, but you, you sort of see them. Like if I move my hand very quickly, you can't see it moving like that. Um, and this, is, this is sometimes called the blurry movement, sometimes called pure movement, omega, shadow, or phi, and objects which are seen moving cleanly are sometimes called optimal or phi. So there's a recent paper arguing that the terminology here is really confused in the right. Um, there's some familiar results from psychophysics in this area which are worth noting. Suppose you have two, two dots, two spots like that, which are displayed flashing on and off. I haven't got it down on this yet. Displayed for around 10 milliseconds. The way the dots are perceived depends on the interval between them. If the gap's less than 30 milliseconds, um, both dots seem to be on all the time. So if they flash them off very quickly, you see a sort of grey haze in both of them. 200 milliseconds and above, and you see them separate as successive. You see, my eyes, you see one dot, then another dot, then another dot, then another dot. We then approach the famous tenth of a second, and things start to get interesting. Um, between 30 and 60 milliseconds, you see just one dot moving back and forth, but too quick to see clearly. You see a blur. That's sometimes called pure motion, because you get this motion, impression of motion without actually seeing anything move very clearly. Um, around 60 milliseconds, you see one dot moving smoothly back and forward. Um, optimal motion is sometimes called. Um, so this intuitively obvious difference between that and this is backed up by the well-known results in psychophysics. Now, a bit of terminological trouble here, namely that opti this opti opti optimal motion effect is sometimes known as illusory motion. In fact, that's a standard terminology in the literature. Um, and this is unfortunate. Because in some ways, it's apt. The experience... Um, doesn't correspond to reality. The reality is a dot flashing there, a dot flashing there, a dot flashing there, a dot flashing there, and you see it moving. So ex the experience doesn't reflect reality. But in another sense, it's inapt because there's nothing unreal about the experience as we've just been going through. So the ter terminology is understandable but unfortunate. Now, going back to Zeno's arrow, we now have an explanation for why the at at theory can seem so wrong. Moving objects often look different from their motional counterparts. So given that, it's natural to suppose that motion is an intrinsic dynamic property of things, because moving things look different from the static ones. And that's why the at-at theory, which says motion isn't an intrinsic property, can seem wrong. A bit of useful terminology. Um, let's distinguish between non-phenomenal motion, or NP motion as I'm calling it here, and phenomenal motion. NP motion is just motion as it is in the physical world, independent of any perceivers. Phenomenal motion is motion as a dynamic phenomenal feature, as it appears in our experience. But that is captured by the at-at theory, and this isn't. So the at-at theory is faithful and accurate with respect to one form of motion, not with respect to another. Okay, <clears throat> now a big question, looking into this conference, um, hence the cosmological backdrop. Um, does intrinsically dynamic motion, does P motion, exist in our universe? Or is it just <laughs> something oh, in our minds? Um, well, a plausible, initial, a plausible seeming initial answer is that immaterial things in themselves, unperceived, no, but in our experience of moving things, yes. Because yeah, phenomenal, it's phenomenal motion, it's motion as it features an experience. The experience is real. Um, now, as I say, this is too simplistic, but a 
pause must even initialize it. Is that if you just you just illuminate it by some sweep of the hand, all conscious beings in the universe. Non-phenomenal motions still exist. The Earth was going around the sun, etc. But that nice visual experience of motion wouldn't. It seems reasonable. But the key point is that a consequence of taking experience seriously, adopting a non-reductive view about experience, is that P motion is real. Um, simply because phenomenal and experiential properties are just as real as anything else. So even if P motion is mind dependent, because minds are real, so, I mean, so is P motion. Phenomenal motion is just as real as anything else. Okay, so so much of the broad picture. Next question is um, what's dynamic motion, P motion, let's grant that it's real. What's its, what's its precise exact place in the, in the scheme of things, the material scheme of things? What's his precise place in the wider world? Um, and here, this is where we're summarizing what's gone on so far. There are many possibilities. Um, much hangs on two questions, both of which are unresolved. So the answers, um, no, if the rest of the workshop's going to solve all these problems, you've got, quite some, you've got some big problems to conquer in the next uh, few sessions. One is how is the phenomenon and the physical related? The big question about the nature of consciousness and how it's related to the physical. And the other is what's the correct account of perception? This will be touched on a bit. A couple of papers, I think. Well, the phenomenon and the physical. Some of you will be familiar with the debates, some of you won't. Um, I've mentioned it already briefly. Um, this is both the two main options here. Dualism. Um, if dualism is true, if experiences reside in non-physical substances or are just themselves non-physical properties, then clearly dynamic motion, which exists in experience, doesn't exist in the physical world at all, uh, presumably. Um, but on the other hand, if materialism is true in some form, uh, an enriched, phenomenalized, Russellian type materialism, then dynamic motion is in the physical world. And I guess if emergentism is true, then um, and you've got this sort of sui generis, or perhaps physical, perhaps mental, especially, no, I think it's usually a sort of mental level, physical level, um, then P motion is emergent. Um, so obviously, how you resolve this question is going to have a big impact on where you locate phenomenal properties, um, dynamic motion in the physical world. I myself side with that one largely. Here's Russell's position, also um, defended by Eddington, um, interesting cosmologist. This is the position I summarized earlier. Um, materialism, which accepts experience to be fully real, doesn't illuminate or reduce experience, but says, well, basically experience, yeah, it exists in brains. Um, there's so much we don't know about the full nature of the um, physical that maybe phys the physical, some aspects of the physical world have intrinsic properties um, which could be beyond anything recognized by current physics. I mean, Russell was of the opinion that physics, because it deals with causal relations, will never reveal, it's not the job of physics, said Russell, to reveal the intrinsic nature of a physical item. I mean, take an electron. Um, no, this little thing could be blown up version of the electron or a proton. The protons are something a bit bigger. The protons are primitive. The quark or super string. Something really primitive. It doesn't have any parts. I mean, physics tells you how this will behave, how it will bounce off other things, how it will react going through um, magnetic fields and whatnot. But what's it like in itself? Well, physicists just don't answer that question. It never occurs to them. What do you mean, do you mean in itself? It tells you how it behaves. Yeah, but someone says, well, yeah, but it's got a little, it occupies a bit of space. What's the intrinsic nature of the stuff that pervades or fills that space? Well, according to Russell, it could be the intrinsic nature of some bits of matter could be experiential. That's how one way you can fit the experiential into the physical. I need to say it's just hand-waving in a way because no one knows how to fill in the details, but it's a, it's a possibility. And a promising one. <coughs> okay. Um, the other question is nature of perception. Um, now, there are two main views. The philosophy of perception is another very complex area with lots of positions. The two main views, simplifying brutally, um, which themselves go under different names, um, direct realism versus indirect realism, I'm calling them there. Some people call it naive realism. 
versus the representational realism, lots of, possibility, lots of terminology. But the two basic ideas, two basic positions are clear. <coughs> Direct naive realist, um, maybe you've asked one of that name, um, thinks that in normal perception, we're directly aware of external reality. So there's a, an, you know, there's a perceiver, there's a bit of the physical world, a nice British post box. Um, and when the perceiver sees the object, they see the object, the object itself is right there, that's what they're directly aware of. There's no mental intermediary, a visual experience which comes between them and the object. The indirect realist says, no, that's all wrong, because Dick, and Descartes saw seeing. Um, what happens is you get you know, streams of physical particles or stimuli, enter the, enter the eyes, get focused, processed a bit, sent on to the brain, and that's where visual experience exists in the brain or the mind, Jake Austin, in the immaterial mind. If you don't directly see the physical world, it seems like you're directly seeing the physical world, but you're actually directly aware of the mental image. So, the indirect realist perspective, um, external items, such as this post box, lack colour in themselves. The colour exists in the visual image generated in response to the external stimuli. <coughs> now, as I said, this is a big debate about which of these views, is, which of basic views is correct, and there's no consensus. Um, I personally favour this one, but in Britain, direct realism is currently very popular. Um, debate wouldn't have to go on. Um, this is worth summarising it. Now, this has, these two basic accounts of perception have implications for where P, the question we're focusing on, remember, is where precisely do P motion properties, phenomenal motion properties, exist in the physical world? Now, if indirect realism is true, they're confined to brains, because that's where P motion properties occur in visual experience. The visual experience is wholly located in the brain, according to the P physicalist. According to the direct realist, however, we're directly aware of external reality. External reality contains moving objects. These moving objects possess motion as an intrinsic property. Therefore, the P motion properties are out there in the physical world and we're directly aware of them. So depending on which view of perception you take, um, it has a big impact on precisely where phenomenal motion properties exist in the physical world. It's all agreed that they're real, these phenomenal motion properties, but did they exist out there in the world, the real physical world, or just inside our brains? Big question. It doesn't really matter from the point of view of what you know, the reality of these things, but it does matter from the point of view of how we think about um, the temporal, well, these important properties, properties which are so important to time. So if, if this theory of perception is true, then for, Temporal passage or flow exists only in brains or other minds or experience generating objects. But if this theory of perception is true, passage exists out there in the world. Which I guess is what you think. Something like that. Now, this sounds odd, of course. I mean, how can it seem odd to think that intrinsic motion could be out there in the world? But it's no, no other than colour. No, physics doesn't recognise colour. Yet, direct realists believe that colour is out there in the physical world, why not motion properties, dynamic motion properties, flow properties? Okay, that's, it. that's my personal preference. I think that makes more sense overall. Um, I sort of buy into the picture of physical objects that physics tells us this mostly force field, can't see how you can be a direct realist without being a very um, kind of anti realist about physics, but it's a controversial area. But so this tick is not objective truth, it's my preference. Now, a more general issue is how um, experience motion relates to temporal passage. I think putting temporal passage into Google, you get that. You just got apt. <laughs> On holiday, he's just aware of time passing. You return to work day, getting closer all the time. Um, now, Obviously, one important point. This P motion, I mean, the thought that time passes is uniquely distinctively dynamic, one important source of that idea is P motion, as we've been hearing and I've been saying. Um, in normal real life, walking on the street, driving along, things flow by. Um, now, 
as I've just been stressing, this forward passage is real. There's an issue about how you're located in the physical world. Um, and it's also part of the physical world if material is true. <coughs> here's another distinction which is hopefully useful. Um, passage distinction between um, passage, M, what I'm calling here metaphysical passage, that one there, or M passage. <coughs> Sorry about all this terminology, because sometimes I need to use so much I forget, about, forget it myself occasionally. Um, it, can, it can be useful. Um, metaphysical passage is um, passage as it applies to the whole universe. It means things like the growing block versus the block view, which denies passage in that sense, presentism, um, the moving spotlight view, these grand metaphysical theories about the nature of time and passage. E passage is what it's, I say there. It's passages, passages, features of experience, or dynamic aspects of our experience which are suggestive of passage, or which nurture the notion that time has an active, flowing character that space lacks. Now, e passage is broader than just motion. Um, e passage, I think, comes in many forms. Um, I thought to begin to go into them here. P movements, one of them, but there's all your experience. Sounds flow, we can hear successions of notes. Um, bodily sensations have a flowing quality to them as well. Mental images, you, know, you can see motion, you can imagine motion, and you can imagine hearing things, feeling things. Conscious thinking, there's some inner soliloquy, the flow of thought one after the other, meaning expression by a mind. All these have a dynamic aspect. Um, so the important thing is. I shouldn't need to stress this really, that everything I've been saying about P movement, namely that it's, it's real, it might be physical, also applies to all these other forms of E passage. They too are real. The forms of experience, experience is real. Um, and so passage in that sense might be real, or is real. Um, and that's what I meant earlier when I talked about um, by recognizing the dynamic aspects of ordinary sensory experience, thought, conscious thinking, etc. Just the general properties of the stream of consciousness. I mean, is, you know, William James described it as flowing. I think he was right about that. Um, when it comes to having an understanding of um, passage as it manifests itself in our ordinary life, there's a lot more to it than analytic process, especially recognized when they just focus on thought and language, like group that. Um, uh, there's, more, there's more to it than new passage as well. I mean, memory and anticipation play a role. Um, there's lots of other, there's lots of, as we've been hearing over the last two days, there's lots of aspects of passage, but this, these E passage, which comes in many forms, is an important core notion, I think. Um, now, let's go back to this issue. Suppose someone said, ah, no, passage is an illusion, nothing but an illusion. Could it be true? Um, well, I'd be arguing not, but let's look at it from another angle. Um, Suppose we do live in a blocked universe. Um, that, that, that's a momentary hypercubes, represented by normal cubes, how the block, snapshot of how the block theory sees the whole universe. Is this universe passage free? Well, no. And yes. <laughs> in a block universe, there's no M passage by definition. M passage is something that block universes don't have. There's no moving spotlight, there's no growth, there's no um, the future exists, no, past, present, future all coexist. So in that sense, there's no passage in a block universe. But E passage yet, because Dennis was pointing out, block theorists can, should, recognize that specious presence, short bursts of experience, which have a dynamic content in all the ways I've just been well, skimming over really, um, are, are part of the block. The so one form of important form of passage, namely E passage, can exist in a blocked universe, even though M passage doesn't. Namely, the temporal becoming construed as reality crashing in and out of existence, or growing, or whatever. Now, also I claim, at least that's on the first pass over, first pass over, that if she might think that, there's a potential obstacle because I'm saying E passage can exist in a block universe. Can we be really sure, though, that E passage can exist without M passage? I mean, what precisely is the relationship between experiential passage and metaphysical passage? I'm assuming that 
there's no dependency. You don't need to live in a metaphysically dynamic world to have experientially or dynamic experiences. But you, someone, could, could, someone could say, no, no, no. Unless, unless there's M passage, you can't have E passage. Well, it's hard to see, on the face of it at least, why E passage should be dependent on M passage. Um, these standard forms of the, there's the great block universe, the moving spotlight, presentism, exactly the same intrinsic properties are found in these universes as in block universes. So if the same type of intrinsic properties can be found in both types of universe, why, and given that you know, E passage exists here, why shouldn't it exist here, that, given that E passage seems to be an intrinsic feature of experience? Second issue, well, second issue, um, some could say, well, does the existence of normal properties essentially depend on the creation and annihilation found in dynamic universes? No reason to think so. Another reason is that, um, well, as Dennis was saying this morning, E passage, these various forms, exists in species presence, these little brief windows during which you're aware of change. Now, there are different conceptions of the species present on the Husserlian view, or Husserl-like view, they're calling it retentional view. Um, the species present actually, objectively, because um, objectively um, durationalists are close to it, but this little durationalist experience seems extended. Um, quite why people think like that, it's an interesting question. But it, some do, it's a very popular view. Um, the other view, um, the extensional view, species presence are extended over time. So if you hear someone go, yay, and you sort of hear the whole thing, that's one species present, and it extends through time just the way it seems to. On the retentional view, that dynamic content is compressed into an instant or something close to it. Now, both, both these conceptions of species, on both these conceptions of species present, there's no obvious reason why you couldn't they couldn't exist in the block universe. And the retentional view obviously could because it just exists in a moment. And given that in a block universe the whole world is extended through time, or time itself, all parts of time are equally real, there's no obvious part reason why this experiential whole, this extensional species present, can't exist in a block universe. There, is, there are problems, on the other hand, in understanding how the extensional species present can exist in a presentist universe. Because a presentist universe is standardly construed. Um, the, whole, the, whole, the sum total of reality exists only for an instant, and then it gets replaced. This sort of experience passage requires a bit of time, more time than there is in the standard presentist universe. So if you think you can establish that this conception of the species present is the correct one, this one isn't, you can argue against the reality of passage of experience to the falsity of the strict standard version of presentism. I think it's an interesting way to go, because I think that's correct for you, for you but we'll try and argue for that here. Okay, so summing up that little bit, there's no obvious reason to think that E passage can't exist in a block universe, and is hence dependent on M passage. By way of conclusion, um, this is thanks to Nathan asking me a question a couple of days ago. About, um, Comparison with what I've been saying here, with um, what Laurie Paul said in a recent journal philosophy paper, um, Temporal Experience, which we heard a version of in the, some of those who were there in the Wake Forest um, event last year. Um, in this paper, she, she, she adopts a, a line of argument which is very similar to the one I've just been propounding, and one of several other people have been propounding as well, um, that, namely that the important source of passage is the experience of motion. Um, but in fact, her argument turn, takes a different turning, which takes me back to the point I started with about the importance of taking a non-reductive stance vis-à-vis -vis consciousness. Um, here's how Paul, here's Paul's argument. Um, apparent motion, this um, effect we were looking at earlier, um, is proof that our brains can generate dynamic-seeming experiences and static inputs. Now, this is helpful to the block. The B theory is trying to explain why time seems to flow and it doesn't. In such cases, there isn't really flow or animation um, in, in the world, she thinks. Our brains create the illusion of dynamism by cr creating dynamic experiences with dynamic content. So far, so similar, but she goes on with a further, st further step to say that. Um, 
But these illusions don't involve the brain literally filling in intervals between the static presentations, the dot there, the dot there. Um, so that's the bit I disagree with, which says that. Um, really, he's saying that these apparent, this apparent motion is, is illusory in the sense that even your experience isn't static rather than dynamic. Um, there's a quote from her. Um, she says, when we have an experience as of passage, we can interpret this as an experience that is the result of the brain producing a, a neural state that represents inputs from earlier and later temporal stages and sim simply fills in the representation of motional change. So far, so good. Footnote, not literally. It just gives the impression of being filled in. There is no figment, as Dennett would say. See Dennett filling in versus finding out. Now, there's two ways of cre creating the impression of motion. Um, one way, call it the, the cognitive or doxastic impression, is an impression in the sense of belief. So you see something and you believe or prepare to say that it, it's motion, it's, no, genuine motion is occurring there. Another way is sensory impression, isn't it? There's really emotion there in the experience. So that's two ways of creating the impression. And I think Paul's going for this version. He's saying this is what's really going on. There's none of that nonsense, actually, real motion. Um, and I think that it's a bad way to go. Um, I denying that experience is, is as it seems to be. Um, I mean, this idea that we can exp explain the the source of um, the reason, you know, why is it that it, the world seems dynamic if in reality it's static, looking at it from a B-theory point of view. Um, this whole direct line of explanation is plausible if experience is really dynamic. If experience itself is not very, it's not dynamic, it's entirely static, then we've got no explanation, we've got no satisfactory explanation at all of why the world seems dynamic if it's really static, or well, physical reality is anyway. Um, so if the aim is to reconcile metaphysics with ordinary experience, which I'm assuming that Paul's aim is that, um, claiming ordinary experience is not as it seems, radically so, is less than an optimal strategy. Um, do we need to, I mean, is Paul right? I mean, do we have any option? But what does Dennett say? There's Dennett, probably not very visible, but in fact, Plaque, which says I'm Dennett. Um, <laughs> that's, he's getting a prize for something. I think it's his book on evolution. Um, now, filling in, uh, he's, he has written a lot on that, um, a bit on a few years ago. Um, sometimes called perceptual completion by psychologists. But the important thing to notice is Dennett's line is pretty controversial, I think, even among psychologists. Um, here's an example case of it. Is everyone familiar with the blind spot? It's a kid's game. I, I used to love playing as a kid. Um, it's basically a bit of, uh, the bit of the retina at the back of the eye where the optic nerve goes in. And there's no light-sensitive cells, so you can't see anything. But you've got both eyes, you can't see anything from that spot. If you've got both eyes open, then they can compensate one another. If you've closed one eye, you haven't got the other to compensate, and so you should see a dark patch in the middle of your visual field, but you don't. You can bring it out. You can actually detect that by, um, if I play with this little game, some of this you've probably done as a kid. Um, where if you approach, say, the cross, you, you look at it the right way, the spot will suddenly vanish. It, it doesn't vanish with a grey hole. What happens is, you look at one eye, it, the brain fills in, it covers it with white. Has everyone done this at some point? Um, if you haven't, go home and play with it. It's great. Um, it should be fun. Um, now, so standard... I mean, obviously, if, if you look around like that, one eye open, which I do frequently, Test my own view. There's no visible blind spot. There's no great hole there. It isn't. Um, the standard explanation is the brain fills in, i.e., what happens is um, the brain gets messages from a bit of the rest of the surrounding where the rest of the optic nerve is in, and it tells the brain, produce experience like they're having and put it there. So when you do this to try and find the blind spot, what happens is the Bits of, the new, bits of the retina here which surrounding the blind spot, they're getting white, and they tell the, they tell the brain, fill in with white. 
So when you, when you approach this, you get, to get the right distance, and this covers, this is being seen by the blind spot. It turns white. What happens is the brain fills in with light, and you clearly see the book. The spot just vanishes. That's why it's good fun. So the standard view of why the hole is not seen in normal life with a person with one eye is the brain fills in with visual pigment, as you might say. So here's what you would see if I my non-autistic impression. So, um, what you might see if the brain didn't really fill in, that's what you do see. If you, obviously, if you look at it with one eye closed, you see the whole thing, you don't see that nightmarish vision. But according to Dennett, there's no filling in taking place. The whole's still there. This is what he, that's the meaning of the quote from earlier on that Paul was quoting, citing. According to Dennett, there's no filling in of visual pigment or figment, as Dennett says mockingly. Um, all that happens is our brain doesn't tell us it's a hole, so we don't notice the hole. But it's there. And to me, this is just, well, I, I don't know. It's economical, it's radical, but hard to take seriously. Um, here's done it on the temporal case. If you, is it the stream of consciousness a fiction? Um, here's a quote from him from Consciousness Explained. One of the most striking features of consciousness is its discontinuity, as revealed in the blind spot in circadic gaps. The discontinuity of consciousness is striking because of its apparent illusory continuity of consciousness. So that's how Dennett thinks the stream of consciousness is really. It's just fragmented massively. Um, we don't notice it. Again, bold, radical, but we need powerful arguments. Now, as it happens, Dennett does have arguments. I'm not going to go into this in any detail because I've forgotten most of the details. Um, back in a paper in the 19, early 1990s with Kinsborn, and again repeated in um, Consciousness Explained, he has some arguments for why um, you should adopt his view. Um, and there's a whole battery of them. They all take, sort of take this, this is a simple case, a case of backward masking. Um, these, these are also really peculiar psychological phenomena if you haven't come across them before. Um, suppose you, this is the case of parent masking. Suppose the subjects are shown a disc for about 10 milliseconds, a solid disc, then a ring, just, which is located just around the disc, after a gap of about 60 milliseconds. Um, and then, then they're asked what they see. So they're shown that, then they're shown that, the brief. And then, when asked what do you see, most of them say, oh, I, I saw a disc. I said, Did you see? Did you, I, see, I saw a ring, rather. Is it, did you ever see that? No. Yet when you do tests to find out, this actually does make a difference. You, you can There's some evidence that a disc-like object has been perceived, but they just report no consciousness of it. So it's, it's a really confusing thing. What's really confusing about it is it seems to be a case of what happens first is making a difference to what happens later. Um, I puzzle in a way. Or I'll, or I'll the existence of this is preventing the experience of that, even though this occurs after that. So it's a positive phenomenon. No one quite knows. There's no search about how to interpret it. Dennett says this. Um, there's two options. Maybe the disc, the, the digital disc thing was seen but then forgotten. <coughs> or maybe it wasn't seen at all. Maybe it was just detected subconsciously. The brain didn't actually give you an experience of it. It just gave you an experience of the ring. Then it then says, it's impossible to find out which of these scenarios is true. Um, so there's no fact in the matter about what's been experienced. So, so basically, so in this sort of case here, there's no fact about what you experienced, and he generalizes this to, quite generally, he says, there's no fact in the matter about what's going on in your stream of consciousness at a given time. <sighs> okay. Um, a couple of quick points. Um, one response is, well, Dennis' argument is like that. It's impossible to find out what's going on, so there's no fact to the matter as to what's being experienced. Now, isn't that verificationist, which generally, you know, it's very popular in the 1930s, 20s, but generally discredited as a part of science. Dennett himself says verificationist, I'm not a verificationist about um, tables, chairs, physics, etc. But verificationism about experience is okay. That's what we should be a verificationist, he says. Now, this is just question begging if you're not predisposed to a very reductionist and illuminativist attitude towards experience. I mean, he's verificationist about some things, but not others. Why? He's prejudiced against experience, therefore, he's 
is a bad argument. Um, I think a more interesting argument is this, in response to this one. Um, he says it's impossible to find out which of these two interpretations is correct. No discovery in future neuroscience will ever reveal if the little disc is experienced or not experienced. Um, well, how, how can he be so confident? I mean, he writes this in 1990. Maybe our ability to find neural correlates of consciousness will improve. Maybe other more subtle forms of experiment will reveal what's really going on. It's early days. Why can, how can he be so confident? As it happened, over the, there's a fair bit of evidence for what um, basically what, what Denner calls the Stalin esque hypothesis, namely that um, there's a delay of between 80 to 300 milliseconds, depending on the circumstances of the time of type of experience. Um, events happen, the brain takes a while to process them after the stimuli reach it. And then it produces experience, and it produces a coherent version of events. So in this view, this is the star nest one, the brain sort of sees a, a brief disk, so the well, stimuli from the brief disk reach the brain, stimuli from the ring reach the brain, the, brain's, the, the, the disk is so brief, the brain sort of re subconsciously, the brain reaches a conclusion, so to speak, that uh, there's nothing, there's no really, yeah, the disk, my, my initial impression that there's a disk out there must be wrong because this could exist at such fleeting times. I'll just give you an experience of the ring. It always happens in this sort of time interval. And uh, this sort of general picture was supported in this paper here. Get to another case. When I was checking on the internet a few days ago just um, to see what else happened, I came across this very nice paper by Michael Todd, um, published a couple of years ago, um, which, goes into, which goes into some, in the whole business in more detail, and arguing pretty. You know, don't ask what the details are, I haven't had a chance to digest them yet, but there seems like a very strong case can be made that if you look at, take a little comprehensive look at the neurophysiological evidence out there, that there is good scientific grounds for preferring one interpretation over the other, so Dennett's just wrong. So there's no need to follow Dennett on this. Paul's line isn't the only line, Paul's line being that there's no real movement there. Um, and so my conclusion, um, namely that temporal aspects, when you combine a non-reductive view of experience with a proper, appreciation, a proper appreciation of temporal aspects of experience, everyone can accept at least one form of passage, even though they'll disagree about where precisely in the wider world it exists. One brief addendum, also by in depth, result of in-depth in internet searches last week, Zeno's arrow paradox isn't the only arrow paradox out there. Can you, can you an archer? There's another arrow paradox that archers, that archers know about. Um, it's basically that, and it links back up with a high speed motion photography, that quite often if you fire an arrow directly at the target, it'll miss. If you fire it to one side, it'll hit. It's because the arrow actually flexes a great deal, and you have to learn how to control that or anticipate it. And it, the, fle the flex in the arrow is really revealed by high-speed photography. And so for a long time, it's a complete mystery why it happens, thanks to honing in on micro-intervals of time and high-speed photography, it's now clear. Uh, it's not really a paradox at all. Arrows flex a lot. But that's the other arrow paradox. Okay, thank you. That doesn't 
gives us the conclusion that uh, the, the P motion that seems to be present in our experience is really out there in the world rather than something that, that we contribute to it. That's true. There's room for that position. Um, and it's, it's one of the great... Um, lot, I, 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 a confession I find direct realism so implausible I never actually read anything about it. So maybe the, well, not much anyway. Um, but maybe there's some Does anyone know any literature on direct realism and this dynamic motion? Any literature anyone familiar with? You're right, dead right. Most of the literature on direct realism just focuses on seeing an object um, and never discusses this. So in a way I was just trying to find the most plausible form of direct realism, or the direct realist most plausible, we should say, if you wanted to do full justice to the dynamic, dynamic features of experience. Um, but in the case of, I don't know, so are you saying that direct realists, when they go to the movies, have a different sort of experience than the rest of us? No, I don't think maybe that's anyone. Mm. Color. Uh, also, the bat. When the bat looks at a pen, it sees the pen. But uh, it's here's the pen. Here's the pen. Sure. Oh, well, kind of perceives the pen in a way. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would also be a direct realist. I'm not. I'm happy with direct realist, right? Uh, about perception. But the, also the bat. I'm also a direct realist about the bat's experiences. And uh, to the bat, it doesn't look black. Well, right. So you, you want a very thin form of direct realism, which sort of perceives. You're directly aware of the primary qualities, but not the secondary qualities. Wait, no, it's, it's realism about the it's, it's direct realism about the object of perception. So, so it gets rid of the sense data when you intermediate objects. You really see the object out there in the world. It's not some, something in between. That's, that, that's, what the direct, that's what I take to be direct. This is a hyper thin though, direct realism. You, I mean, you don't just see the shape of the object in some kind of ghostly form. You don't perceive any properties the object has. You've just got this bare awareness of an object out there. Phenomenologically, that doesn't seem. One of the main motivations for dynamic. It's a, it's a direct realism that is a sort of. It, it's, it's, uh, it retains the feature of the indirect realism, which I think is plausible, that, that perception is a joint metric. It involves the perceiver with uh, her perceptual operation, it involves the perceived object, and how this thing turns out depends partly on the features of the object being perceived and uh, on the perceptual operators of the perceiver. And you know, as some interesting questions that we need to ask how the two work together. The direct realism, mm -hmm. as I understand it, I'm not an expert, so I'm happy to be <laughs> uh, correct about this, is that this is a, in, in the Tim sense, in the Boswell sense, is, I think is that we just have the perceiver and the object, and they have this kind of joint venture, but there isn't anything, any additional sense data or anything else in the middle. Mm -hmm. so. I think, for sure, there's. Give me a, as, as I said, the, of course your perception is a very rich field and lo loads of positions out there, variations of each other. Uh, and that's certainly one way you could go. You could certainly say, yeah, I'm aware of the object, but I'm not aware of the P-motion properties. Uh, I think one powerful motivation for direct realism is that we want to do justice to how things seem. And yeah, the, the world seems to be, as, no, I seem to be presented with the world out there, rather than the inside my own brain. Um, they also seem to be presented with things which are moving. So I think if a a, phenomenal, a direct realist who wants to save the appearances to the greatest extent possible would go my way, I think, rather than your way. But there is room for going my way, does have disadvantages okay. too. Okay. You gave a very big weight to uh, illusions of uh, human vision. And you are trying to make some philosophical statement. Hmm. It means, like, if we, will be, we would be built better, and uh, instead of our eyes, well, this ultra-fast uh, photography and ultra-fast computer, uh, we will see this error exactly like you in the last paradox. So we will not have all this kind of illusion. Right. Would you make a different uh, conclusion? You, in the beginning you mentioned, uh, if I understood it correctly, that Russell suggested there is kind of direct experience which is not yet in physics. Yeah. That does you, do you mean that it's really something crucial in humans, that there is something there that we still don't know? But this seems to, seems to be strange, because if there is something, we can make experiments with humans and uh, see how they behave. 
if this direct experiment does not change their behavior, I don't think it has any interest in it. If it changes the behavior, it can be seen. So do you believe that there is something special? Uh, sorry? I mean, am I clear? I mean, don't forget, the idea that um, P motion or passage generally as it's experienced is illusory depends on your possible perception. I mean, if you're a direct realist of the kind I've just been talking about, it's out there in reality, on the surface, as it were, on that view. Um, whether or not, but let's, you know, let's put that to one side. Um, would it be better, if I, if I were a god designing a world, into the scratch, and have that all power to do I light. Would I let people, how would I show that world to them? Would I let them see, suppose the world is just as the physicists say it is, it's just static. Would I, would I grant beings the ability to see individual moments? I don't know, I think it'd be very boring. There's an infinite number of them between any two intervals, and so you'd, you'd have an incredible, boring experience of seeing everything, but repeated over and over again. It could be a blessing that we don't, not condemn to that infinite repetition. Maybe that's why. God is merciful, after all. Yeah. Uh, well, my main question is, is about the end passage and the e passage. Actually, uh, it seems, even though you try to argue that there is no dependence, uh, uh, namely that we can have e passage without end passage, I'm not sure uh, in a physical structure. You can pass. You can pass this argument. Namely, let's not suppose from the outset. Let's let's just suppose from the outset. We don't take. I mean, let's just assume that whatever, whatever, uh, you know, my brain is just made of made of electrons and so on. I mean, just the, the standard physicalist uh, assumption, just for the sake of the of the argument. And so, you, you, your brain's made of electrons and protons and matter, and none of that matter has experiential properties in the way that Russell thought it might have. Yeah, and, uh, and so I'm not yeah, dull, 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 this is a, a crazy view of it <coughs> about it uh, for, for the moment. Okay. Uh, it's very radical and so on. So just let's assume standard physicalism, uh, and, and in particular that our brains are just made out of, you know, whatever particles that, that this table is made, is made of. And, and, just, and, and for the sake of, of further simplicity, let's just assume the identity theory in the of mind. Right. Just, just for simplicity. But you've just eliminated the experience there. No. Because your brain, if there's no experience in matter. No, no, there is experience. I mean, we will not. But no, if, if, if there are no phenomenal properties no, in I mean, matter, then yeah. you're now saying experience is identical states of matter, then there are no phenomenal properties, so no experience no, no, exists. No. So, well, back to the eliminated, there's no well, experience. Well, well, this is just for the purpose of, of making the argument simple. But if, if you. If you I don't think there's logical room for experience to exist on your, within the framework of your assumptions. Everybody in the philosophy of, of mind literature uh, agrees that the identity theory doesn't eliminate experience. There are two forms of identity theory. There's one which says conscious states are identical with physical states, but physical states don't possess any phenomenal characteristics. That's one version. The other one is that conscious states are identical with physical states, Therefore, given that experiential states obviously have phenomenal properties, so too the, the physical states with which they're identical. That's another okay. identity. That's the more plausible one, sure. In that, if you're going to go the identity route without an eliminating experience, given that experience undeniably has certain properties, so with a physical state with which it's identical. That's why it is all identity. If, Okay, I mean, I, I, I'm willing to take the, the better option for, for the other. I just okay, want to okay, say this, so I mean, it's, it's, it does, because, I mean, there are lots of reasons to reject the identity theory anyway, so. But let's just, just to make things simple, what I want to say is that unless you presuppose from the outset that, I mean, if, if you agree with the physicalist assumption we started with, I just don't see how you could have e-passage without end passage whether you take identity between mental states and physical states or whether you take supervenience, it just doesn't seem to be logically valid. Because, because, I, I mean, because you say, I mean, if you, if you agree that there is no passage, there is no passage in the electrons that make up this table, mm. 
And so there was also no passage in the electrons that make up my mind, my, my brain. Yeah, no, no metaphysical passage, yeah. So no metaphysical passage. passage. So how could there be, how could there be e passage in, 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 in my brain states? But that there, there can't be in, in, yeah. in the... But it, it all depends on the, whether there's a plausible argument that says you can only have e passage, you've got n passage. And I, I agree it's a much bigger issue than I've given it credit now. Right. If you, can, if you can think of a good argument, well, let me know, because I'm collecting them. <laughs> okay, are we out of time? So okay. thank you very much. Thank you. University and next year she will be here a postdoc uh, fellow in uh, Edelstein and already published an interesting uh, article and uh, uh, she will be talking about the uh, title on the continuity of transition. So, Tamar. So I want to continue the discussion on the experience of transition and temporal flow, and I wish to begin with uh, William James, who described this experience in the following manner. I read the first quote. What I do feel simply when a later moment of my experience succeeds an earlier one is that though there are two moments, the transition from the one to the other is continuous. Continuity here is a definite sort of experience just as definite as is the discontinuity experience which I find it impossible to avoid when I seek to make the transition from an experience of my own to one of yours. This is an intuitive definition of continuity which implies the smooth transition we experience, a process in which many successive moments join together to create a unified stream. This description of continuity involves a multiplicity of moments, albeit without a breach, crack, or division, as James defines it elsewhere in the principles. However, each of the two ways by means of which we commonly <coughs> describe continuity entails a difficulty that appears from a different angle each time. James refers to it as the general conceptualist difficulty of any one thing being the same with many things, either at once or in succession. If we first analyze continuity in terms of succession, that is, in terms of moments ordered before and after one another, it seems that the continuous transition we experience eludes us as something that happens between successive moments. As James writes, how is the transition from one to the other continuous taking into account there are two moments here? We can attempt to resolve this difficulty by adopting the second description of continuity as implying this present duration in which we actually experience the continuous transition. Here, duration is the initial datum. It is an undivided temporal stretch. However, this description in terms of units of duration does not resolve the difficulty 
which now actually appears twice. For once we admit that the units of duration are ordered in succession, this felt transition we try to define slips between those units once again. This time, the difficulty also appears in a new form in relation to each unit, since as a temporal stretch, this unit seems to contain earlier and later phases. As such, it is subject to an analysis in terms of succession. Only now are these successive phases all thought of as contained in the present. This is the problem to which Barry Dainton refers to as the extension and simultaneity problem, and I will return to it later. Thus, the general problem lies in the fact that neither the idea of multiplicity of elements, which are ordered in succession, nor that of a whole temporal interval, clarifies the process of unfolding moment that creates the complex yet unified whole, a process we refer to as continuous transition. In other words, the attempt to determine a priority of one of these features over the other fail to capture this experience that we have of continuity as transition or a flow. That being the case, the question becomes one of how to reconcile the two aspects, duration and succession, both of which our experience of continuity seems to involve despite their incompatibility. I will use the approaches of James and Whitehead, who both focus on the question of how to reconcile the tension in order to illustrate some aspect of this attempt. <clears throat> they believe that our experience of time is, compo is composed of pulses of experience. Each pulse is nothing at an instant. Like a note of music, it requires its whole period in which to manifest itself, as Whitehead writes. <clears throat> and since they hold that our experience of time is composed of whole temporal intervals, they need to handle the tension on the two levels and explain our experience of continuous transition between the units and within each unit. According to James and Whitehead, it is experience that serves as the starting point for a more general analysis of temporal continuity. They believe that this feature, transition, passage, or flow, which is striking and obvious when we examine our own stream of experience, must be also clarified in the framework of an ontological analysis of temporal continuity. Thus, their position should be considered in relation to the ontological debate regarding the nature of time. The question of whether we should rely on our intuitions while conceptualizing temporal continuity is the issue at stake. Russell, in his analysis of continuity in our knowledge of the external world, clarifies the bone of contention. He insists that it is unnecessary to explain temporal continuity on the basis of our experience thereof as transition. Our experience does not reveal some metaphysical truth about the nature of time and of transition or passage as its features. The concept of continuity becomes entirely clear in its mathematical definition. Uh, I read quote 2.1. Uh, a property only possible to a series of terms so that we can say of any two that one comes before the other. This doesn't mean, however, that the thing suddenly jumps from one position to, to another since as the um, infinite divisibility of distance and, and time shows, there is never a next position or a next instant. James and White deny the applicability of the mathematical analysis of continuity to our experience. In fact, James finds this line of thought so unreasonable that he claims that it would be unfair to charge Russell with writing metaphysics while defending it, and that his defense is probably only acceptable in the framework of his mathematical analysis. James writes, 2.2. The mathematical definition of continuous quantity is that between any two elements or terms of which there is another term, is directly opposed to the more empirical or perceptual notion that anything is continuous when its part appear as immediate next neighbor with, nothing, uh, with absolutely nothing in between. Whitehead's formulation for this idea is also apparent in quote 2.3. Every act of becoming 
must have an immediate successor if we admit that something becomes. Russell actually mentions the discomfort that arises while we try to eliminate the identification of continuity and this felt transition. He refers to his critic's claim that there seemed to be an unbridgeable gap here between the mathematical definition of continuity and our experience of it as transition. There remains a feeling, a quote 2.4, there remains a feeling of the kind that led Zeno to the contention that the error in its flight is at rest, which suggests that points and instants, even if they are infinitely numerous, can only give a jerky motion, a succession of immobilities, not the smooth transition with which the senses have made us familiar. However, Russell insists that there is a way out of this uneasiness. For example, our physiology can probably explain the gap and thus at least prove that the mathematical model may be applied to the physical world. Therefore, in spite of the fact that continuity is easier to feel than to define, as he admits, our feeling of it need not be taken into account in the analysis. In fact, it is better for us to eliminate our discomfort by means of a conscious effort to feel the nature of the mathematical theory of continuity and the concept of a series upon which it, which it is based. That it is difficult to do so is simply because when a theory is apprehended logically, there is <coughs> of, often, I read a uh, quote 2.5, a long and serious labor still required in order to feel it. It is necessary to dwell upon it, to acquire the kind of intimacy which in the case of foreign languages would enable us to think and dream in it. I want to discuss a more specific argument advanced by Russell, clarifying two senses in which he denies the idea of transition. These two senses relate to his general denial of change in the metaphysical sense, as he phrases it. In addition, they are the senses that according to James and White that we must affirm in order to reconcile the tension between the concept of succession and duration. First, Russell denies the temporal relation are internal and can therefore somehow affect the nature of an object. I refer here to his uh, attack on Bergson. Uh, change is merely a relational difference, and there is nothing more to it. Since points or instants lack complexity and do not differ in respect of intrinsic properties, the relation between any two instants is external. So it is meaningless to claim that there is a real connectivity among the phases of temporal process or that its parts are connected in such a way that they cannot be analyzed separately. It is a mistake that results from confusing a thing with the change it undergoes, that is, with its external relations. Russell emphasizes the problem here. He claims that if we take temporal relation to be a formative part of what the thing is, if we think that it is defined through its relation, then we must end up with the conclusion that there can be just one fact concerning the thing. If a thing is, indifferent, is different in any one of its, of its relation, two facts indicate that there are two things. This means that it's the same quote as uh, you already saw it, uh, 3.1. Nothing happens when a body moves except that it is in different places at different times, the eta theory of motion. Of course, a, body, a, a moving body always passes by a gradual transition if by this we refer to the mathematical theory of continuity. But there is no transition in the sense of some aspect that is required for the analysis of temporal continuity and indicates that the parts of the temporal process are bound together. Thus, motion does not involve a transition from place to place. <clears throat> Second, Apart from his denial of real connectivity among the phases of temporal process, Russell objects to the notion that transition indicates some action on the fundamental level of reality. There is no such thing as a state of change, he writes, and criticizes Leibniz's assumption that, uh, 
The body must contain in itself the principle of change, force, or activity by means of which a meaning is given to a state of change. Russell emphasizes this point while analyzing Zeno's paradox of the flying arrow. As Russell suggests, the power of this paradox resides in Zeno's implied assumption that when a thing is in a process of change, there must be some internal state of change in that thing by showing that there is no such state that is considered essential to change, Zeno denies the reality of change and motion. Thus, what Russell denies is first, the transition indicates real connectivity among parts of temporal process. The parts themselves are not complex and do not change in relation to their intrinsic properties. Second, he denies the transition implies a dynamic feature or that the state of change is itself an intrinsic property which is requ required for the reality of change in general. James and White had rely on the two aspects rejected by Russell, namely connectivity and action. How does connectivity help to explain the relation among <coughs> units of duration? The basic assumption states that the relation of every unit of composition to other units are internal, that is, they are the constitutive of what the event is in itself. <clears throat> what about Russell's objection, ob objection that the thing cannot be characterized by its relation since it could not then preserve its identity? Following White and James, we have two alternatives for dealing with the difficulty. We can claim, as does Whitehead, that every drop of time becomes a complete whole with its internal set of relations to other drops. It is a discrete pulse of experience that becomes and perishes and contains only one set of relations. White then goes to present a systematical method of analyzing extensive relation in, among the drops and continuity. However, even if we accept <clears throat> this analysis together with the idea of extensive ultimate drops, even if we agree that each of the fundamental elements becomes as a complete set of relations, these ideas are not helpful in explaining the experienced continuity. Taken on its own, Whitehead's analysis of extension is not inclusive. It doesn't answer the question of how atomic individual bricks create the experience of a continuous flow. Thus, we must bring in an additional factor. Continuity or transition in the context of the relation among the drops implies the process from one drop to its successor. The concept of basic unit includes the idea of interaction. What Whitehead suggests is to understand succession through causation, which is the reason for it. He claims that our perception of extensive relation is always accompanied with a direct perception of causation which represents the asymmetrical temporal order of succession and promises our experience of passage and flow. In such a way, the physical relation among the, the pulses constitute what we call the extensive continuum. As a matter of fact, the extensive continuum is not a mathematical continuum explainable in terms of an infinite series of points and instants but rather points and instants are possibilities for division abstracted from the real connectivity among the extensive drops. Whitehead writes, 4.2. There is becoming of continuity, but no continuity of becoming. The actual occasions are the, are the creatures which become, and they constitute a continuously extensive world. In other words, extensiveness becomes, but becoming is not itself extensive. Thus, the idea of nature at an instant is itself nothing but an abstraction of actual facts, which due to its usefulness has pervaded the human mind and removed us from the concrete facts of nature and of experience. Another alternative for dealing with, this, with the difficulty is to claim as does James, that we can actually attribute two or more relations to the same thing as our experience shows. 
For what actually happens is that something appears to stand in between those things that come before and after. It is in the middle, and this affects its inner nature. James Wright, uh, 4.3. The notion that relations come between their terms must be given up. No mere external go-between can logically connect. What occurs must be more intimate. The hooking must be penetration, a possession. The relation must involve the term. Each term must involve it. And merging thus their being in it, they must somehow merge their being in each other. Though, as they seem still phenomenally so separate, we can never conceive exactly how it is that they are inwardly one. Thus, what, what real connectivity implies is the intermingling of successive phases. This explains the feeling of transition, or co-conscious transition, as James calls it. Our experience is without a bridge, crack, or division, since the units of composition are not distinct, and all real units of experience overlap. This does not mean that an object appears twice, but only points to our inability to use one phrase <coughs> to describe the several connections in which it exists and the failure is only verbal. Despite Whitehead's and James' differing definitions of connectivity, they insist that succession is only a second-order conception, an abstraction from the concrete facts of experience. It results from recognizing elements within the stream, and then, here is Bergson's formulation of this uh, idea at uh, 4.5, setting them side by side in such a way is to perceive them simultaneously no longer in one another but alongside one another. What we refer to as process must involve more than a mathematical conception, conception of order. Connectivity constitutes constitute a continuous transition and allows our analysis in terms of before and after rather than the opposite. The idea of pure succession as they designate it, is insufficient in itself to explain to con continuity. And so connectivity becomes crucial for the explanation of our experience of success, succession as a flow. While taking it into consideration, the tension between the idea of succession and that of unified flow disappears on this level since the continuous transition does not fall between the units. Connectivity, however, is just one side of our experience of continuity and is in itself incomplete. We must also consider action. This is evident especially, but not only, when we consider every undivided unit of extension. I would now like to return to the, to the extensional simultaneity problem and use it to summarize the discussion. The problem, again, is that of understanding how the contents within each unit are said to be successive, although they all belong to the same temporal stretch we refer to as the present. Barry Denton responds to the difficulty by claiming that what the term present actually indicates is a phenomenological feature rather than a temporal location. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal presence within the scope of the species present that all the successive contents share. <clears throat> As James writes, the literally present moment is, is a purely verbal supposition, not a position. In fact, this is exactly what the whole idea of the species present implies. The only way to make sense of our experience of change and persistence is on the basis of a direct awareness of successive contents. This is how we should read James when he claims that the former and the later are included in the minimum of consciousness. Since if we do not feel both past and present in one field of feeling, we, would feel, we feel them not at all. Thus, the fact that we experience contents within the species present, is standing before and after one another, gives rise to change as an immediate datum of our experience. <clears throat> this solution is, is meant to ensure that change and persistence are immediately experienced by us. However, it is important to recall that James and Whitehead, in their analysis of time itself, 
defend the idea of an extensive yet an undivided unit. Time itself comes in, comes in drops, James writes. Thus, the problem also appears to us on the ontological level, as Blake complains, I fail to 5.5, I fail to understand how a whole, every part of which is simultaneous with every other part, can be properly characterized as duration or can be, in, or can be said to involve a definite lapse of time. Here, while, while the while the insistence on successive parts that are given together cannot be addressed in terms of experience, we must face these ontological challenges of how to understand the status of parts and explain the reality of change. In this context as well, the intention of their insistence on the idea of a basic unit of extension is to promise the reality of change, since if in the, I read the quote 5.6, if in the natural world, there were no other way of getting things safe by such successive addition of the logically involved fraction, no complete unit or whole things would ever come into being. But in point of fact, nature does not make eggs by making first half an egg, then a quarter, then an eighth. She either makes a whole, he whole he egg at once or none at all. <coughs> and so of all her other units. If all change went thus dropwise, so to speak, if real time sprouted or grew by units of duration of determinate amount, just as our perception of it grow by pulses, pulses, there would be no Zenonian paradoxes. This means that every unit from which time itself is composed is a drop or fell transition. In spite of the fact that what has become is subject to analysis in terms of earlier and later phases, when each drop of perception is considered in and of itself, it appears all at once as an amount of a felt transition. Activity must join connectivity. In principle, this felt transition does not result from the relation among the successive phases that each drop contains because what we call parts here is only the outcome of a methodological distinction. It is only through discriminative attention that we can recognize them. This is why Whitehead claims that there are in fact two different modes of analysis here. One mode of analysis is that which we employ while analyzing physical time in succession. <clears throat> Both are constituted by the relation among the drops. Here we focus on the extensive character of the drops rather than on their individual character. But we can also focus on the nature of each and every drop, on its being an individual quantum rather than on, on its relations. Focusing on this aspect, we cannot construct a temporal succession since each phase presupposes the entire quantum. Thus, although we must describe each pulse of change in terms of parts and the relations among them, each pulse considered in itself is prior to, it, to its part. It is a pulse of transition which is the reason for the flow of time and for relational changes. Whitehead insists that we must be able to express this idea that there is no nature apart from transition on the ontological level. And although James is less decisive than Whitehead about how to apply this feature on the ontological level, he, ex he expresses the very same idea in the framework of our experience of time. <coughs> I read quote 5.7. Either your experience is of no content, of no change, or it is a perceptible amount of content or change. Your acquaintance with reality grows literally by buds or drops of perception. Intellectually and on reflection, you can divide these into components, but as immediately given, they come totally or not at all. Not only that the earlier, later relation, relation is directly given to us in our experience, but we know the meaning of the earlier, later relation in virtue of the intuition of the pa passage of time in itself. 
Only by taking the feeling of transition itself as an initial datum that, give, that is given to us all at once, on the most fundamental level, can we extricate ourselves from the complication that arise when we try to understand the first datum of our experience. Otherwise, it would be difficult even to describe the first datum of this immediate apprehension of successive contents. Without the idea of transition as an intrinsic property of each unit, we get lost in the maze that is demonstrated by the following attempt, 5.9. The odd feature of the species present is that, is that like a block or total lapse of time apprehended all at once or simultaneously, it's being apprehended is a necessary condition for the discrimination of before and after, a type of discrimination which can only be made within a time lapse or temporal hall already known. The apprehension of time as, as duration is not built up from awareness of succession, but awareness of succession is itself due to prior awareness of a whole, sp of, of a whole or span duration of time already lapsed and within a past and present are simultaneously present. In order for the continuous transition to be real on this elementary level, as James and White had insist it must be, it is not enough to rely on the internal co complexity of each unit. It is not only that each, each such unit changes in relation to its intrinsic property, properties. Rather, each has a state of change or transition as an intrinsic property. This dynamic feature is the reason rather than the result of our experience of temporal process as involving earlier and later phases. Ultimately, continuity cannot be explained in terms of succession, nor can it be explained in terms of coexistence. Both succession and coexistence are abstractions that cannot capture the essence of time as being what hinders everything from being given at once. Thank you. points and instances are abstraction yeah. from, from the entities. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so my question is, is, is uh, do you think that's the right way to think about time? And um, did William James have anything as worked out, formal, as Whitehead did? Um, I, I mean, I really don't know. It's unlikely. If I think it's the right way to think about time, well, I think yeah. Whitehead would say that this is the only way you can think about time if you rely on our experience okay. uh, that this way is more reasonable than uh, taking points or instances as uh, initial datums. But do you think it's true? Um, I read him quite a while, so he convinced me. <laughs> I, think, I think he has good reason. If you start with experience or if this is, this is your starting point, there is it's as reasonable as to assume that uh, points and instants which we use in uh, calculation and physics are, uh, what it would say, nothing but useful abstraction. And uh, actually, Leibniz has a similar conception of, uh, of uh, momentary quantities uh, uh, useful in, uh, in uh, 
mathematics, but uh, what actually happened is discrete pulses. So, and the second. So, so did, did William James? And this is really a question that displays my ignorance. Not really having read William James. <laughs> so, so why then has, has his work out the uh, method of extensive obstruction? Did William James ever proceed from? Uh, not really. What? Yeah. Not really. What he did say is that uh, it distinguishes two senses of continuity. One calls the standing continuity, and the other one is the growing continuity. And uh, the standing continuity is the one that we can analyze in terms of points and instant. But the gro gro growing continuity is what actually becomes or happens. And here, the mathematical analysis is useless uh, or is insufficient. Me? Short question about about Russell actually because I mean the the quote you you brought from Russell seems to be in stark contradiction to to the Russellian. I was thinking about that. Yeah, we talked and about it also. Wondering whether we, I mean, your view really comes from Russell or maybe he changed his mind or I mean, do you know anything about that? Well, actually, the, the part I read is from a. Uh, 1914, and just one year, I think, before uh, our, experience, our experience of time. Uh, I think what Russell is doing here is to speak about mathematical theory of continuity and defending it. He has another analysis of, rela of temporal relation as we experience it. And in the second case, he gives room to the relating relation, as he calls it, of we can feel how the um, moment relate and the relation that relates these moments itself is uh, important, but it's a separate issue. Uh, so, so you feel that, 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 you could, that you could reconcile between what he says here and what Nathan said about yes. the transitory moment? Yes, because, because what he talked about then the Russell's analysis of experience, and, but in principle, but Russell did change his mind. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. There's a moment where it was faced with white and Yeah. So he changed his mind. Well, it, it, it was, uh, it, I guess, changed the mind. He sharpened his argument, I would say. It was a, a turncoat. In his analysis of matter, is very similar to some senses to white. I think. I mean, Whitehead and Russell, they were, they, they were co authors. They, they worked together, then they had a falling out. Particularly on, on, on their, their uh, interpretation of person. But Russell started out being opposed to the relationism about time, and then he changed his mind, and he has a bit of order in time where he, where he presents an alternative to the Whiteheadian abstraction of uh, time to know it then. So he, first he was against relationism, and then he was in favor of it, and probably had three other views as well. Good. Yeah, I would only add to that that uh, the, the essence of Russell, as I am understanding it, is, is that uh, uh, relations universal and, and uh, relations of external relations, so so that uh, they, they couldn't have their ground in terms of any properties, in terms, and in particular temporal relations, but in, in terms of the dynamic aspect of time. He, he actually talks about that, but he, he does talk about relations as having sense. And uh, this is true of all relations, and uh, it gives a temporal relation to be different from, from all other relations. And that's what it is for to be symbols. And so that's what differs space and time work, that there are spatial relations which are simple, and there are temporal relations which are simple, and, and they, they both have a sense. And, sense uh, in the case of temporal relations is the a transition. But and I, I also think that uh, one, one could uh, hold a relational analysis and not, not treat the terms as being uh, uh, momentary so that it's compatible with, uh, uh, with the terms of temporal relations as having some relation. Better. A couple of questions about James, who's a writer to say wonderful, but we've really more reason than me. Um, <coughs> one, one question, um, do you think 
changed his views, changed a good deal from principles of psychology yes. in 1890 to these later periods. He said he was clearly not educated from James Bergson, he returned, but he thought he couldn't rationally comprehend lots of blood experience. Why? Do you have any idea what he found? Um, Richard Gay actually discussed this point, the difference between the stream of consciousness, uh, the stream of thought uh, chapter and the perception of time chapter in the principles and the later works. And um, he points that the only place that in which James actually referred to the species present is in the principles and later is more conscious about adopting this concept since uh, he emphasizes the Bergsonian uh, spirit of intermingling of parts and uh, the feeling of uh, so he cannot rely on discrete pulses and uh, emphasizes the feeling of uh, in terms of overlapping and uh, intermingling and also the feeling of causation and move to more books on the But in the, in the chapter, in the stream of the thought chapter, where he discusses the transitive parts, uh, it, this is also very good. He, he says we cannot, if we try to, to stop uh, to stop thought in the middle, it would change and it would kiss being itself. It would... Um, it's like uh, the attempt to, to stop uh, something in motion uh, in order to track its motion or to... So, so there too, and he, he never, never say in this chapter anything about the species present, just uh, in dynamic term of flow of thought. So I think maybe what is exceptional is the part in which he tried to to deal with the species present as a distinct unit. Yeah, I was, I was kind of very hard to work, to work out what James' own position is on like, you know, the species as a piece of principles, because it's a funny book, because it's part textbook and part James' own views, and it's, it's a lot of just presenting other people's views, it's a lot of presenting his own, it's really not clear that he's doing it in point itself. It's, it's very intermingling. Yeah, it's intermingling, which occupies rational comprehension. <laughs> Um, so I, I always have a hard time to follow how continu continuity is extracted from, uh, <coughs> from the, the droplets of uh, experience. And, and maybe, maybe you can take me through that job more slowly because uh, I understand how we make a how, how we arrive from the from these droplets to abstractions, but um, well, what, 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 Oh, um, the overlap business, uh, phenomenologically, I don't, I, I, I can't relate it, relate to it. I don't, I don't, I don't find in my experience, in, in the continuity of my experience, any kind of overlap between droplets. That's something that's completely absent from. If I reflect that my own experience, I don't see any kind of overlap. So, and I don't see the intermingling. I don't, you know, if I, I, I follow something move slowly, not an arrow, but just you know something move slowly like this, as Barry with his hand. Um, I don't see overlap, I don't see intermingling, I just see this thing move. Mm -hmm. So, go, going back to the place where you, your, your talk connects with Barry's, you know, if, I, if I want to be a direct realist about these things, or the, the, you know, trying to develop some kind of direct perception, and yeah, I'd say my hand is moving, it's a, it's a property of my hand that it is moving, and I'm seeing the motion of, the, of this hand. Um, I'm, I'm not reconstruct, reconstructing the motion or somehow deriving the motion either from uh, discerning overlaps or mingling. Or, you know, I see the hand move. That's all it is. And I see its con the continuity of its motion directly. But I understand there's a problem with that. And if I understand correctly, I think uh, James tries to give a different but which I've never really managed to. Thanks. It just makes sense. Why it does not give uh, an account in terms of intermingling? He relies on distinct units with 
each unit is internal self-regulation and they uh, have a common, uh, they connect. Uh, he explains in the extensive uh, abstraction uh, method of this is explain this, uh, explain extensive relation of continuity in terms of contiguity and the uh, contact of entities. But I think this is not as important as the other point because even his formal analysis and he, he gives form analysis on, also in early work and in his later works, but um, it was never enough. It was never enough in order to promise our experience of a, of a motion as a flow. So, so finally, he, he explains it in terms of uh, causation, but uh, the question is not how, how we reach to the concept of points or instance from these uh, units or how it explains continuity. But uh, our experience of it is uh, what's occupied here. So. Also seems very Aristotelian because it's a verb while it's a substantive. But drops, drops. Um, so I was wondering if you could think that that's part of it. That there's it's always teleological in a sense. It's always it always goes somewhere. Yes, I think. That, um, I think they would agree. Uh, and for why did each while. Well, he explains the relation among the drops in terms of uh, causation, so he explains each drop in terms of fine causation and reaching to, it, to its end, and uh, so it's very... Uh, regarding the idea of abstracting the moments out of continuity, so take any uh, scientific uh, identity like Paradigmatic, uh, paradigmatically, the identity of lightning to the electrical discharge or to heat as a main molecular uh, motion. Um, so one way to describe it would be, okay, we've got the phenomena uh, of uh, what we experience and then we want to save the phenomena and we do this by uh, suggesting some sort of uh, theoretical entities such as electrons and Mm -hmm. All the rest. And in that case, it seems real to me to say, well, this is a mere abstraction. Okay, we abstract, we can, you can say, we abstract the theoretical scientific entities out of the uh, phenomena, but um, it's, I mean, it doesn't make it less real, the fact that we abstract it. I mean, it doesn't make it an abstraction, it makes it, uh, those theoretically, Theoretical entities. But the, these theoretical right. entities are, I specifically refer to point and instance, and there are many other examples in physics which White gives in order to show that, uh, or in terms of experience, that there is, um, it draws a lot of analogies from one level to the other, so it, it's not, uh, there is no tension. In these levels of, in of, of the phenomenon of the end of experience and of, uh, of physics, just the, some concepts in which we use in order to calculate, but other terms we don't. So. so I'm not sure I understand. Is there a is there a, a like a difference that make it, that makes a difference between the between um, heat and uh, molecular motion and um, continuous time and moments of time or I would say that these are two aspects of, uh, okay. of uh, the phenomenon. Right, so basically it's the same thing. Yes. Uh, well, well uh, Whitehead's uh, times are abstraction, they're abstract in the sense that 
they're classes of events, they're abstract entities. And what, so if you look at the ultimate furniture of the universe on Whitehead's view, what you see in all the concrete stuff are events that uh, stand in temporal relations to one another. And uh, times are abstractions as a useful fictions, you know, a way of talking about uh, the events, but they're not, they don't, they don't get, get into the ontology on the ground level, so you say. So that's, you know, in, in, in the sense for why it times on real, they're just kind of cooked up out of the events. So in that sense, I think the abstraction of everything in that sense is really different from the identification of temperature with mean molecular energy. It would claim that atomicity and the continuity balances each other, that continuity it comes from discrete pulses, so that these are two aspects that we see in the phenomenon. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Thanks for touching your the about Google Lake. It's a case of I suppose you can use to recognize I do that. <laughs> 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 Say, um, two species present, so it's, it's, the whole thing is taking even more. But you do see, uh, you, you see, you see the hand go from there to there, and from there to there. And then, so this point of trajectory of lines with that point of trajectory of lines with that point of trajectory. Don't you see that? No. <laughs> <laughs> It's the same part. It's the same part. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tamara.